I am a financial genius. I can tell you how to invest optimally using 21st century asset pricing theory. Great news. I love to do things optimally. What is your theory? That expected investment returns are a positive linear function of risk. Just choose what level of risk and expected return from the security market line that you want, and lever your diversified portfolio accordingly. Okay. What is risk, exactly? It is uncertainty we do not like because we cannot diversify it away. Yes, both Shakespeare and the Bible mentioned diversification, to mitigate this risk, that is a good thing. Yes. But what is this risk left over, that we cannot eliminate? It is the undiversifiable risk, such as the risk from wars and recessions. I do not like those. Neither does anyone else, which is why you should expect a premium for it. Otherwise, no one would take risk. That makes perfect sense. What should I do? As I said, you should invest in a broadly diversified portfolio, leveraging your investment based on how much risk you can tolerate for a specific level of expected return. Do people invest that way? No, there should be a handful of funds, not tens of thousands. Most people are massively under-diversified, often having a small number of stocks dominating their portfolios and exclude assets outside their home country that would provide greater diversification against business cycles in their own country. So, the theory does not work? The theory still works because the effects of the theory are true. It works as if people were investing as they were acting this way. It is the as-if theory. Excellent. I like as-if theories. I suppose that risky assets have higher returns than non-risky assets. Yes, because over time expected returns equal average returns. So, more volatile stocks have higher return than low volatility stocks? No, actually, the reverse. Is not volatility risk? Obviously not, as returns are not higher for these companies. We look instead at covariances embodied in betas. So high beta stocks have higher returns than low beta stocks? No, actually the reverse. So, risk must then be a probability of default and things correlated with it like low profitability and high leverage, as proven mathematically by Miller and Medigliani. Such stocks must have higher returns. No, actually the reverse. Well, penny stocks are very risky, they must have higher returns than your average stock. No, actually the reverse. What about companies with high uncertainty as reflected by trading volume, or dispersion of analyst forecasts, they must be risky. No, these uncertain firms have lower returns than average. WTF. In what way are low beta, low volatility, low uncertainty, low probability of default stocks, with high profitability risky? They sound like the opposite. This makes as much sense as postmodern deconstructionism. We have some powerful econometric techniques that are solving that right now. Good luck with that. I guess currently the theory does not work in stocks. No, stocks are a great example of risk. Small cap and value stocks have higher returns, because they are riskier. In what way are they riskier, if not in volatility, beta, profitability, or leverage? They have higher returns. Isn't that backwards, return defining what is risky, as opposed to risk predicting returns? What is risk, other than what is correlated with high returns? It is something that is positively correlated to our wealth. If it goes up when everything seems to be getting better, it is risky. If it goes up when things generally are getting worse it is insurance, and we pay for that. So, is real estate risky? It depends. Maybe. Is gold risky, or safe? Again, it depends. This all seems very confusing. We should find some clear examples where this theory works, as if people are investing as you think they should. Do high-risk private investments have greater return than lower-risk equity investing? No. Do volatile commodities or currencies have higher returns than their lower-risk counterparts? No. Do long-shot sports bets, like 50 to 1 horses, have higher expected returns? No. Do highly volatile mutual funds have higher returns? No, as I said, volatility is not risk. 
I thought risk was volatility. That is just a quaint motivational tool we use on MBAs to motivate our more realistic theory. Risk actually has nothing to do with volatility. My bad. How about 5-year versus 30-year government bonds? The one merely has a higher covariance than the other with the unidentified risk factor, and they are highly correlated, so one should merely have more risk, and thus return, than the other. That is a good test. Alas, it must be an incorrect one, because it does not work. The new initial public offerings have high returns, they have a lot of uncertainty around them. If you measure them at the IPO price, yes. Otherwise, no, the reverse. Do undeveloped country equity returns have higher return than safer developed country equity returns? They seem risky to me. No. Do equity options, which are levered positions in equities, have higher returns than the equities they are attached to? No. But we have a theory for that. The theory of skew loving says that people love lottery ticket type returns, which is why options have such bad expected returns. So, if they love gambling, in what way are they risk averse? They still do not like volatility, they just like really high returns. Well, really high returns and volatility go together, so which preference dominates? In gambling, volatile stocks, and equity options, skew loving dominates. I do not see how you can describe people as generally risk averse, and have this strong positive skew preference. A theory is a useless tautology, unless the offsetting effects of risk aversion in the positive skew preference can be estimated from something other than the historical returns they are used to explain. We have models that prove this all as a consistent framework, rigorously grounded in utility maximization and statistics. Well, how can you disprove this theory, if so many intuitively risky assets have low expected returns, because of this skew-loving preference? Once we find the priced risk factors, called a stochastic discount factors, all will be well. Aren't theories supposed to usually work? How many more decades do you need? Our theory is demonstrated empirically by the fact that aggregate equity returns have been 5% greater than money market returns in the 20th century for the U.S. I presume you adjusted the equity return for geometric averaging, survivorship bias, taxes, adverse net capital inflows to the market, and of course transaction costs. Sometimes. But never all at the same time, because that would get rid of our most conspicuous and intuitive supporting data point. So, you tendentiously avoid corrections that would have been applied to any alternative, highlight this one data point, and say your theory works. It does not work within equities, or across currencies, commodities, most bonds, and gambling. Why do you really think it works? Because it should work. You should have to take risk to generate a higher return. People who got rich did take a lot of risk. You seem to have made a logical mistake. Just because it takes risk to become rich, does not imply risk-taking, has a higher expected return. That cannot be true. Economists' fundamental conception of utility is an increasing but concave function of wealth as a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of a risk premium. Harry Markowitz turned asset pricing theory into a rigorous science by showing how statistics and utility theory can be combined to explain why assets are priced as they are. What did Harry Markowitz do? He proved mathematically that people should minimize risk given a targeted expected return by ridding their portfolio of idiosyncratic risk. He showed that investors should strive to be on their efficient frontier, a curve in expected return and volatility space. Do people ever use the efficient frontier to choose how to invest? Not exactly. Risk is no longer portfolio volatility, so that is now irrelevant. So, what did Harry Markowitz teach us, exactly? That we should be diversified. I thought the Bible and Shakespeare said that. But Markowitz led to Bill Sharp, who created the capital asset pricing model. What is that? It is the theory that greatly simplified the Markowitzian problem, showing all you needed to know is an asset's beta, or covariance with the market, to determine the risk, and thus expected return. But you said high beta stocks have lower returns than low beta stocks. That is not important. 
the cap m led to stochastic risk factors that show it as the correlation with the marginal utility of the representative agent that matters just like in the cap m but you replace the market with the marginal utility of the representative agent how do i measure that we are working on that and new powerful econometric methods are close to an answer what if we just ignore risk, like they do in derivatives pricing, and just focus on the expected payouts discounted by our cost of funding? Alas, that is what everyone does. Well, if you know the correct theory, and no one seems to be using it, shouldn't you be able to make easy money? In theory, yes. In practice, no. I'm still not getting how this actually works, if no one acts as if it does, and it only explains returns using the hindsight of past returns. I still do not know what I can do with this theory. It says I should diversify, fine. But use a point in risk expected return space. I don't know how, because I do not know what risk is. Like I said, we are working out the final kinks. I have a marvelous proof that is unfortunately too large to fit in this interview. Just remember, finance is the only part of economics that works. Just look at derivative modeling. Do they use risk premiums? No. So that's something different? Yes. But look at the higher yields on junk bonds. But that is just for expected loss rates from defaults. The historical return on junk bond portfolios is similar to that of triple B portfolios. Nice catch. But treasury bills have lower rates of return than equities. But why? As you said, it is not from its mere lower volatility. Obviously. Treasuries must have lower risk than equities. What is risk, again? I already told you. Uncertainty we do not like. It is correlated with aggregate marginal utility. You told me, but you mentioned a couple highly qualified anecdotes. Most of the data are exceptions to your theory. I know vaguely what risk is, but as a practical matter it is totally undefined. We are building powerful econometric techniques that are just about to figure this all out. Yeah, good luck with that. I am a financial genius. I am. <laughs>